another field entered was transportation. In order to tie together projected operations, late in 1942, the AAF established the Air Transport Command. Starting with military passengers, dispatches, and mail, its planes in the summer of 1943 began handling vital cargoes as well. Previously, troop carriers and other units organized in the field had been flying supplies into isolated areas, particularly China. In 1944, these operations were consolidated under ATC, and with the addition of larger aircraft, were greatly expanded. In 1945, when the strategic emphasis shifted to the Far East, they were further enlarged. In 1945, more than ever before, the long overwater distances of the Pacific had to be bridged. Redeployment across the Middle East and the United States had to be undertaken, and China had still to be supplied. This so-called hump operation was regarded as one of the highest priority missions of the AAF, so much so that bombers were especially modified for the purpose when transport planes were scarce. By transporting and supplying the tired armies of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, and by keeping the Flying Tigers of the 14th Air Force in the air for their magnificent showing, this operation, more than anything else, served to encourage and support China in her darkest hour. A hitherto weak nation, by receiving this helping hand, was put into position to become a valuable working partner for future peace and security. Meanwhile, our forces were closing in toward Japan from the southwest Pacific. We captured Leyte in the Philippines in November, and on January 9, 1945, landed on Luzon. Manila was shortly thereafter invested. On February 16, 51 C-47, of the 317th Troop Carrier Group, carried the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment on two dropping missions to Corregidor, which we had lost early in the war. Scraping and bombing of the island preceded the dropping operation in which 2,000 troopers and 1,300 bundles of supplies were landed in a target area of one square mile. Naval landings followed. Corregidor was completely secured at the end of 11 days. The war continued into the more remote portions of Luzon. Napalm and phosphorus bombs were dropped from aircraft to route the Japs out of the jungle cave in this tough struggle. Gradually, resistance dwindled to isolated points well protected by the terrain. At the same time, B-29s of the 20th Air Force, based in the Marianas, were carrying forward the air war against Japan proper. After the capture of Iwo Jima by our Marines in March, and after some experimenting with different tactical concepts and types of approach, this campaign began to assume major proportions. Its efficiency improved. The B-29 Super Fortress carried 6.3 tons of bombs, or four times the load per sortie of the heavy bombers used in the European theater and carried it over twice as far. From April 1st until June 21st, our Army, Navy, and Marines joined in the assault on Okinawa. The Japs counterattacked with suicide planes, which cost us 35 ships sunk and 300 deaths. B-29s were called in to stop this intrusion at its source by pockmarking the Japanese airfields on Kyushu and Shikoku. They succeeded in reducing the size of the counterattacks from 500 aircraft to 50. In mid-June 1945, General Arnold announced that a prolonged war might involve our dropping three times as much bomb tonnage upon Japan as we ever dropped on Germany. Up to that time, Tonnage dropped on Japan had not exceeded 50,000 per month. The future plan in sheer weight dwarfed all previous conceptions of aerial warfare, calling eventually for a rate of 700,000 sorties and 3 million tons of bombs per year.
The grand total dropped on Germany by the AAF and RAF combined had been but two and a half million tons for the entire war. But the final accounting of air power was not found in bomb tonnage or range or number of sorties, but rather in the effect on enemy targets. The Mitsubishi Aircraft Engine Works at Nagoya, largest engine factory in Japan, after seven B-29 attacks, wiped out as a military target. The Mitsubishi Aircraft Engine Works at Shizuoka, second largest in the country, destroyed in a single strike. The Naval Oil Storage Depot at Oshima, a major depot in the Japs Oil Storage Network. In one attack by 88 B-29s, 90% of its installations destroyed, more than 1,200,000 barrels of storage capacity knocked out. The city of Osaka, second in Japan, had a population before the war of over 3 million. It embraced many of the leading industries of the nation. It was also one of the major ports of Japan, with ships departing and arriving daily from all parts of the world. Its docks and warehouses naturally became a high priority target for firebombs. In one attack of the 20th Air Force, lasting three and a half hours, seven square miles were burned out. Tokyo, the capital of Japan in pre-war days, had six and a half million people, making it the largest city in the Far East. Besides its oil refineries and steel works, it had of recent years become a manufacturing center for aircraft and engines. The AAF began to move in on this, its final goal. As plane after plane returned from successful sorties, Japan's eventual defeat became only a matter of time. At the same time, Japan was being harassed with another weapon, less publicized but nonetheless effective, sea mines, laid from the air into the very light stream of Japan. Patient study by Army and Navy intelligence pointed to the targets, the harbors of Rangoon and Mulmain, next the rivers in Burma, then the ports of Indochina and Siam. Early participants in this type of warfare were the 10th and 14th Army Air Forces, along with the United States Navy, the Australians and the RAF. A coordinated mining campaign was also started to cover the Japanese-held ports in New Guinea, the Solomons, Salabes, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, and Malaya. Later, it was planned to mine the Chinese harbors and rivers, and finally the waters of the Japanese home islands themselves. In 1943, slightly over a thousand mines were laid in these waters of the so-called outer zone, interrupting the supply line to Burma. In 1944, the campaign was considerably stepped up, with 4,000 mines laid in the approaches to the Burma and Malay ports, and in addition, in the harbors of eastern China and the Yangtze River. Since 90% of Jap Air Force supplies to the south were waterborne, this campaign put a crimp into Japanese aerial operations, as well as into naval and land activities, at relatively small expense to ourselves and our allies. By 1945, sufficient supplies of mines were in prospect for the scheduling of an all-out campaign against the Japanese homeland. By August, over 12,000 mines had been laid in Japanese home waters with concentrations in the inland sea the industrial ports, and the Shimonoseki Straits. As a result, in May, the Japanese had to abandon the great port of Mochi. By June, shipping through the Straits in the Inland Sea was reduced to one-tenth of normal volume. The final effect of this operation, as determined after the war, was to block up traffic at the docks and to prevent rapid shifting about of remaining units of the fleet. A million tons of merchant shipping were put out of commission, damaged or sunk, constituting well over a tenth of Japan's maritime losses for the war. Some sections of the country, as well as outside islands, were brought to the verge of starvation. 
It was proposed next to deal with the railroads, as had been done in Germany, but the war ended first. Total aircraft losses for the entire series of mine-laying campaigns came to 55 Allied aircraft, including 15 B-29. In the entire war against Japan, AAF losses to the enemy amounted to 4,530 aircraft, one-third of which took place in aerial combat. The AAF, in turn, claimed responsibility for the destruction of 7,360 Japanese planes, plus 2,540 probables. As the Japanese warlords began to read the signals, an event of profound importance was taking place many thousands of miles away. On July 16th, in the remote desert lands of New Mexico, was born... ...the atomic bomb, the fruit of three years of effort on the part of several thousand Americans who had not been talking much. Existence of this new weapon was not made public yet, but President Truman sent a message to the Japanese reviewing events and suggesting an immediate surrender. Stubbornly, Japan refused. Therefore, on August 6th, the new bomb fell on Hiroshima, the home of Army and Navy ordnance shops and a major staging area and port of embarkation for the war. Up to this point, it had been scarcely damaged. The Japanese still hesitated. On August 9th, Russia declared war on them and started to invade Manchuria. And on the same day, the atom struck again on Nagasaki, which had important steel and munitions work. That was enough. Japan wanted peace. And on September 2nd, a formal surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The total effort of the AAF against Japan came to sorties 670,000. Bomb tonnage, 503,000. Rounds of ammunition, 171 million. Aircraft lost, 4,530. Asked to give in their own words their opinions on Japan's defeat, several high-ranking Japanese officers submitted the following. Admiral Kachisaburo Nomura, member of the Privy Council, former ambassador to the United States. Airplanes and the submarines damaged our shipping very much. At the end of the war, we had a few lines of communications around Honshu Island. Lieutenant General Seizo Arisu, Chief of G2, General Headquarters, Japanese Army. We lost about 600,000 tons of shipping in the Rabur area, mostly as a result of attacks by B-17s and B-24s. The Battle of Midway impaired our ability to send planes to Rabul because of the loss of the carriers. In the Philippines, many planes were unable to move from the ground due to the vigorous attack by the U.S. Air Forces. Vice Admiral Kenji Ugaki, Commandant of Ominato Naval Bay. Our scarcity of minesweepers made it difficult to keep pace with your aerial mining activities. Captain Toshikazu Omai, Chief of the Planning Section, 1st Department Naval General Staff. Specific causes why Japan failed to carry out her objectives in the Greater East Asia War were, first, the defeat of the Japanese Air Force, second, the lack of materials. Fleet Admiral Osami Nagano, Chief of Naval General Staff and Supreme Naval Advisor to the Emperor. Generally speaking, the primary importance in modern war is control of the air with a well proportion army and navy. If I were to give you one factor as a leading one that led to your victory, I would give the air force. The AAF had also devoted attention to tactical and strategic improvements and particularly to technical development. In aircraft, heliocopters were improved. Airplanes with pusher-type power were designed. Others lacking vertical surfaces were put into the air, but time did not permit the carrying of these designs 
to the point of mass production. An indicator of things to come was the development of jet propulsion as exemplified by the P-80. For years, the qualities of aircraft of greatest general interest were speed and range. Back in 1909, a speed of 45 miles per hour and a range of 50 miles were the order of the day. Speeds of 125 miles per hour were attained during the First World War. During the 20-year period between the two wars, airplane performance in both speed and range increased impressively. Before World War II was over, speed had again approximately doubled. As a matter of coincidence, the same was true of range but still greater speeds and ranges were in the offing. What would happen in the next generation, in the next decade, in the next three years? In the comparatively new but portentous field of guided missiles, the aerial torpedo, the glide bomb, and bombs of the Azon family made their appearance. None of these were self-propelled, but they possessed important control features. Rockets projected from aircraft through the factory. Specialized missiles included parafrag bombs for low-altitude bombing, and phosphorus and napalm bombs for large-scale incendiary effect, particularly on troops entrenched or concealed in the jungle. Our British allies developed the giant bomb Tall Boy, which weighed six tons. With this, a near miss was as good as a hit on upright structures, such as bridges and factories. Our enemies, too, had not been technologically idle. Germany introduced the rocket-propelled Messerschmitt 163, which, although of short range, could climb to great heights with lightning-like rapidity to provide interception at short notice for targets in the locality. German jet aircraft included the Messerschmitt 262 fighter, the effectiveness of which was dissipated when Hitler ordered that it be used as a bomber and the Heinkel 162 intended to oppose the Allied escort over Germany. Most striking of the German inventions were the guided missiles. The waterfall was a radio-controlled rocket for use against aircraft. The V-1 flying bomb became well known after its introduction on D-Day. Controllable both as to range and azimuth, it was used chiefly against Greater London. Later, it was directed at supply columns. The giant V-2 stratospheric rocket had even more positive implications for the future and for the United States. No defense or warning against it was immediately apparent. Its speed by far exceeded that of other guided missiles, while its range and accuracy were still in the developmental stage. That these missiles had not been fully developed, and that owing to material shortages in Germany, they could be introduced only on a limited scale were strokes of fortune for the Allied power. The Japanese, not so resourceful, resorted to phosphorus air-to-air -air bombing to long-range balloons intended to start fires in the United States, and to the use of special suicide or kamikaze aircraft attacks on our Navy. Although injurious, these measures never inflicted critical damage, but here was an example of how regimented masses of men could be stirred into deliberate self-destruction through a fanatical psychological build-up. Even if the atomic bomb did not decide the war, by hastening the end, it saved many lives. Its main importance, however, like that of the V-2 and target-seeking attachments, seemed to lie in the future. But the best way to win a war is to prevent it from occurring. A better man is required to avoid an obstacle than to overcome one. By preserving our strength, we make an ally rather than an enemy of time, and we ensure our standing and our security.
Those who contemplate aggression rely on our neglecting it. We can never be completely certain about the future, but we know that improved atomic bombs, pilotless aircraft, traveling at supersonic speeds, and guided missiles are or soon will become realities. They are weapons with which we could strike swiftly and conclusively at any enemy. During World War II, America's air potential came of age. It grew up in size, efficiency, striking power, and in technological development. That process of growth took time but we must now realize that never again will we have time for such expansion. We must maintain an adequate, well-trained, fully equipped air force of the kind necessary to use these new weapons quickly and effectively. If we fail to keep not merely abreast, but ahead of technological developments, we needn't bother thinking about another period of expansion. We will be totally defeated before any such expansion of our armed forces could take place. We must continue our progress. That will be the best guarantee against a World War III.